No, yeah, all right, super. Um, so we're extremely pleased to have uh, Jean-Francois Paquet uh, to start off our CTMP seminar series for the semester. Um, JF got his PhD from McGill and then had postdoctoral stints uh, at Stony Brook and then Duke, um, got it, getting the PhD in 2015. Stony Brook postdoctoral uh, researcher until 2017, postdoc at Duke uh, for two years and then a research scientist for three years and then since 2022, uh, JF has had a permanent position at Vanderbilt University. Uh, fantastic, very, very good. Uh, JF is a true world expert in theoretical high energy nuclear physics. I would say most well known, um, correct me if I'm wrong, for, for the theory of uh, thermal photons, uh, but also knows, knows plenty of other very interesting things. And we're really excited to learn about little bangs and big data today as the first seminar leading up to the second seminar uh, a week from today. Yeah, so Jeff, please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is uh, the first of, of two talks. Uh, the uh, next week is going to be um, uh, more research oriented with uh, uh, with uh, more discussion of the of the photons of the electromagnetic emission and heavy end collision that. Uh, that will uh, hint at about and, and other results. Uh, here I'll start, uh, I'll take many steps back to, to introduce and give perspective on what we're trying to achieve when we study uh, collisions of nucleus at very high energy. Um, as well said, I'm from uh, Vanderbilt University. I've been here for, for two years. I think I'm uh, trying to advertise it here. I think most people uh, might know where Nashville is. Uh, given the cerebral status of, of some, some people from here. Um, so we, we all learn in usually high school that uh, if we want to build a periodic table, we can start with three ingredients. We need the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. And depending on the number of, of each one of them, um, you can build all these different atoms that have very different chemical properties. Now, the, the protons and neutrons are uh, bound into the nucleus, and the electrons are uh, bound, are form a bound state with this nucleus. Um, so basically, the, the atoms are an electromagnetic bound state, which again, depending on their uh, electron layer, Take on different um, take on different chemical properties. Now the nucleus itself uh, is made of protons and neutrons, and so nucleus is also a bound state, uh, but it's not bound together by by the electromagnetic force, of course, because uh, neutrons don't have an electric charge. Proton would repulse each other, so so the neutrons and the protons are bound together uh, by the uh, strong nuclear force. So we have two different types of, of bound states. We have the electromagnetic bound state, that is the atom, and we have the strong, uh, strong force bound state, that is the nucleus. Now the protons and neutrons themselves are made of uh, composite, they're composite particle made of subatomic particles, and those are quarks and gluons. And so quarks and gluons, uh, they bind together again through the strong nuclear force and uh, they form bound states, they form protons and neutrons. Now there's something, uh, now the, the, the theory of, of quarks and gluons is uh, well understood. Uh, it is uh, what we call quantum gluon dynamics. It's this essential part of of the standard model where we have the electromagnetic, the electromagnetic force, the, the weak force that are uh, one part of it, and then you have quantum chromodynamics, which is the other part. And quantum chromodynamics really is the um, is effectively the interactions, all possible interactions of your quarks and your gluons. And um, and so so just like uh, atoms, uh, if if you if you try to build uh, different types of atoms, um, 
you uh, you get the you get the periodic table. If you try to uh, build different types of particle from quartz and gluons, you get a some sort of periodic table of your uh, bound states of quartz and gluons. Now, depending exactly on what kind of uh, quarks uh, you put together, you will get uh, you will get particles that we call hadrons uh, that will have different properties. So here on the right, I show uh, only uh, I show only bound states that have an even number of quarks and anti-quark. And you can see that uh, there, there are patterns, there are families of particles of, of hadrons that are repeating. And uh, the protons and neutrons are not in here because protons and neutrons have an odd number of quarks and gluons. And so you have similar, you can make similar tables for, um, for uh, baryons, which are any particles are made of, any uh, particles are made of, of an odd number of quarks and gluons. Now there's something fundamentally different between a bound state of the, the fact that, for example, the nucleus is a bound state of protons and neutrons, and the fact that protons and neutrons are bound states of quarks and gluons. So in a way, both are bound states who are held together by the strong nuclear force. Um, now the difference is that uh, for the protons and neutrons, um, what you're what, when they're bound together in the nucleus, you're, uh, it's, it's some sort of leftover strong nuclear force that binds them together, something closer to a van der Waal uh, force that binds molecules together. While for protons and neutrons, it's really directly the strong nuclear force that are binding together. And one way in which they're completely different is um, um, you can remember that. Um, if we want to break apart a nucleus, we can do it um, easily. It's been done. Well, easily is, of course, I'm a theoretician, so so it's easy for me. Um, now, you actually need the proper experimental apparatus to do this. Um, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, the Oppenheimer movie. So there's a reminder of, of this critical process uh, where if you send a neutron at the right energy, on the, on the uranium atom, you will effectively break apart this uranium atom into uh, two smaller nucleus and then some neutrons. Um, and uh, by itself, this reaction, there's nothing, um, there's nothing necessarily too dangerous about it. One of the issues is that the, these neutrons can then trigger a chain reaction. So that's where the that's where the bomb part comes, but as far as we're concerned, um, the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, it is possible to free the neutrons that are inside a uranium atom or a nucleus in general. And, and it's typically it's easier to emit uh, neutrons than protons, but you can also free the, the, the protons as well. If you try to do something similar, Using a, a, a proton, for example, you try to break apart a proton into its quarks. Um, one, one way that you can do this is to send a very high energy electron beam on a proton. That's a process that is called uh, deep inelastic scattering. And if you do this, you will manage to break the proton in smaller, uh, basically, you will manage to break apart the proton but you will never see the quarks and the gluons from it. The only thing you'll see is more bound states of quarks and gluons. So you'll see more hadrons. So you shoot an electron and a hadron and you end up with at best more hadrons at the end. Now that's a, that's a fundamental property of quantum thermodynamics, a fundamental property of quarks and gluons that we call confinement. Um, it's it's the idea that you can never see um, you can never see uh, quarks and gluons by themselves. 
they always come into what we call color neutral pair or color neutral um, uh, color neutral state, um, which means that you always have um, right. You you can never see uh, you can never see the the quarks and the gluons uh, by themselves. Um, you can see again. You can see um, composite objects of quarks. You can. It's, it's even theorized. I don't think there's. Uh, they're, they're difficult to measure. So I don't think there's uh, experimental evidence for it. But you can have a blue ball, which is a combination of blue one that uh, would also be um, what we call color neutral. So all of this is possible, but it has to be. Uh, there has to be a. Uh, kind of, there has to be a neutrality with respect to uh, the charge of the of the strong interaction, which is the color. Now, a related uh, property, or a related property of quark and gluon, which is very unusual, is that um, unlike unlike basically every force that unlike most forces that we're used to, um, the interaction energy between quarks and gluons decreases as the energy of uh, the interaction is, so it's inversely proportional to the energy of the interaction. So, so let me use an example. You have two quarks colliding. Um, now, of course, we just discussed, you can never isolate quarks, so this is a thought experiment. But imagine that instead of having two electrons colliding, uh, you have two quarks colliding. They uh, they collide. They exchange a certain amount of of momentum, of, and uh, they they move in some other direction. So the amount of momentum transfer that there is will determine how strongly those quarks are interacting. So if you exchange a small amount of uh, momentum you'll be here in this region. So you'll interact very strongly if you exchange a small amount of momentum. And you exchange a, if you exchange a very large amount of momentum, you'll be here. So the interaction strength is decreasing as you're exchanging more and more momentum. Now, this is, so uh, this curve here is, uh, so this property is called asymptotic freedom. And this curve here, you can see the points, which you can see the data points here, which are measurement. And you can see a line, which is a prediction of quantum dynamics. And it's been known for, for decades now that they have very good agreement um, between uh, doing the data and the, and the calculation. Now, this asymptotic freedom leads to um, a very interesting property of, of quarks and gluons, or of nuclear matter in general. Um, let's let's again let's use this a thought experiment. Imagine that you take a box and you put uh, hadrons in it. Any any sort of bound state, nucleus, any sort of bound states uh, that are made of um, quarks and gluons. You take this box and you start heating it up. Um, what's happening as you're heating it up is that the the particle the the hadrons that are inside the box are colliding more and more often. You're giving them more and more energy, so they collide more and more, and they will keep colliding until uh, basically you're slowly increasing the energy at which they're colliding. Um, and the question is, how much do I have to turn up the heat? before the, the bound states of quarks and gluons will uh, basically uh, disintegrate into the quarks and the gluons, and that this heat, the, the temperature that I give, will prevent the quarks and the gluons from recombining into hadrons. So if you just keep turning on the heat, you know at some point you will go from a, a box, a gas of hadron, to a gas of quarks and gluons. Now, we know that this temperature has to be very, uh, very high. Um, so, so I tell students that work with me that um, in our field, we work with a very strange temperature scale where your coffee is cold, but also the sun is cold. 
And the reason <laughs> the sun is cold is that the sun is made of nucleus protons. Um, so it's made of bound states of quarks and gluons. As long as you're made of bound states, for me, it's, it's cold matter, right? What's hot is what is high enough that you can see quarks and gluons. So we know the, the lower bound. We know certainly the sun is, is too cold. Uh, what is the highest possible temperature we can think of? Well, if you take all the matter in the universe and you compress it back to, uh, to a point, at some point in the early universe, um, it should be hot enough that you're back to a plasma of quarks and gluons. And we do think it's the case. Now, we don't think this is happening a million years after uh, the Big Bang, not an hour after the, the Big Bang. We think this is happening uh, 10 to the minus uh, five seconds, so a couple microseconds after the Big Bang. So that's how early after the Big Bang you have to go back to compress all the matter and melt your protons and your neutrons into a plasma of quarks and gluons. Um, so we know here, if you're here, you can you can have a um, you can have a gas of quarks and gluons, and somewhere in between you have a transition between the two. Now, just for context, um, I, I know, uh, for example, something like neutron star mergers have been in the news a lot thanks to the gravitational waves that we can now measure from them, and for context, this is an extreme event. Effectively, uh, um, you uh, you compress the matter a lot. You create a, a very hot and dense uh, a plasma in there. Um, for our perspective, this is still a this is still a low, relatively low temperature event. Actually, um, so uh, so the threshold. Is very this threshold where you can produce this plasma of quark and gluon is very high. Uh, so, and in general, it, it's very difficult to achieve in astrophysical events. Uh, so, as I said, at in the early universe at very high temperature, you obtain a gas of quarks and gluons. Um, at low temperature, you have a gas of, of protons, neutrons, and other hadrons. And somewhere in between, um, you should have a liquid, a strongly coupled quark gluon plasma. Now, why would you have a liquid? Well, we know that here, um, the neutrons and the protons are trapped. Here, you're, you're in this region here where you have very, very strong interaction. So you just freed your quarks and your gluons from the nucleus, from the protons and neutrons. You just freed them, but they have a very strong interaction. So the interaction is too strong to describe the resulting plasma as a gas. Um, so what you have is a very strongly coupled plasma. It's only if you keep going down here, um, you have more and more, you have higher and higher energy between your quarks and your gluons uh, as you crank up the temperature, that you can reach this weakly coupled gas limit. Um, now, what I'll be describing uh, in the rest of the talk is some of the property of this uh, of this strongly coupled quark gluon plasma. Um, now, um, there's there's a very big difference, or at least we expect, uh, in general, big differences between the properties of a strongly coupled plasma and property of a weakly coupled plasma. Now, this, in a way, is a very significant challenge for us because um, just like in statistical physics, where, uh, in a way, gases are something that we can study uh, with, with quite a bit of detail. We know the, the ideal equation of state of gases. You can use um, the Boltzmann equation. You can use kinetic theory to look at gases. So in general, when you have dilute systems, it's easier to study those systems and to do pen and paper calculations. On the other hand, liquids, even just water, are very difficult to study um, because the interaction, it really matters what kind of uh, molecules are interacting. Liquids are actually quite complex in general. Uh, 
Now, this the same uh, the, the same uh, difference exists in in uh, nuclear physics. Um, we can actually compute a lot of properties of the weakly coupled quark gluon plasma. We can compute its equation of state. We can compute its viscosity. We can compute um, effectively. We can compute a very large number of its properties. Um, in contrast, we can compute almost nothing about the strongly coupled quark gluon plasma. And that's why, in part, we want to measure those properties. Now, how do we create a quark gluon plasma in practice? Of course, the, this, the, what I described with a box that you're heating up is not something uh, you can do in practice. What we do instead is collisions of nucleus uh, in very large colliders. So the two colliders that have been studying, uh, that have been running uh, and have been studying high energy collisions of nucleus are the Radio Physics Heavy Collider uh, on Long Island in New York uh, at the Brookhaven National Lab and the Large Hadron Collider that is in Geneva. Um, so I think, uh, so, so I know that many of you are, are familiar, well, I'm sure you're familiar with both, but I think many of you are working on, on, uh, on the an experiment at the Large Hadron Collider, if I'm not mistaken. Um, now, the key of creating the plasma is that we uh, we take large nuclei and we give them very large kinetic energy, and we're going to use this kinetic energy as a way to heat up the plasma. Uh, so how much kinetic energy do we give? We give something between uh, uh, hundreds to thousands of times their rest mass energy we give to the nucleus. So we accelerate effectively the nuclei to um, to a, a large fraction of the speed of light. And uh, we make them collide in uh, these detectors. And then we um, we form, for a short amount of time, the plasma of quarks and gluons. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Uh, this is an animation that I think maybe the Atlas collaboration made a couple of years ago. Um, and so nucleus are colliding. Uh, inside the detectors. And um, what you see, of course, is actually not a quark gluon plasma forming. What you actually see after those two nucleus collide is a shower of particle coming out of the collision region. And from this shower of particle, you have to um, do a very careful forensic work to try to reconstruct what happened during the collision and try to convince yourself that the only way that this shower of particle has these properties, and by that I mean that there's this many particle of a certain species being produced, that they're produced in this direction as opposed to that direction. Um, so, so you have to use all of this information to try to reconstruct what happened during the collision and make sure that what happened was the formation of a plasma of quarks and gluons. Um, we assist, we're assisted in this by incredible detectors that are, um, of course, essential. Um, having, having a great collider is, is important, but um, it's like having a, uh, doesn't, doesn't matter how beautiful a landscape is. If you're trying to take a picture, you also need a great camera. And um, here we have these incredible cameras. We have at the relative heavy collider, we had two main experiments. It's a star and a phoenix experiment. Nowadays, uh, star is still running, and there's a different one, which is S Phoenix, that is currently uh, taking data. Uh, but the the relative physics experiment at the at the Brook, at Brook National Lab is going to wind up uh, soon to to make a way for the electron ion collider. So this one is specifically the star uh, detector. And you can see there are actually many people working on it. And you can see a, a person for, uh, for scale. Now, uh, there are multiple detectors at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, the, the major ones are Atlas and CMS uh, that, are, um, that were 
effectively built for the proton proton program that, for example, discovered the Higgs and, and does uh, uh, particle physics um, and, and uh, some nuclear physics. And then there's the ELISE uh, detector that is that was specifically built to study collisions of nucleus, to study a quadrant plasma. And there's a small experiment called HGB, and there's an array as well of, of smaller experiments. And you can see here for scale uh, a person. Um, so the ELISE uh, detector is actually quite a bit larger than, than the STAR detector. Now, um, these detectors, uh, we describe, we, we often talk of them as, as, as if they were one, one block of, of detection, uh, just, just a, something like a CCD. Um, if, and when I say this, I mean, uh, sometimes the theorists describe them as if they were just a CCD that, that, that was taking pictures. But of course, they're very, uh, they're very elaborate uh, detection uh, machine. Uh, with multiple layers and different particles are are detected in different layers. So, so this is a CMS um, detector, uh, an image uh, from from uh, uh, David uh, Barney. Um, you can see in the first layer you have the electromagnetic calorimeter that uh, measures photons and measures uh, electrons. Uh, then you have uh, another layer which is the hadronic calorimeter that measures charge hadrons. And uh, here later, uh, you have additional detectors that can uh, measure muons as well. Uh, so as a reminder, if, if you're not familiar with the muon, it's the, um, or if you don't remember, it's the um, heavy, uh, it's the heavy cousin of the electron, uh, much heavier, uh, also somewhat, uh, somewhat difficult to measure. And so in a way we have our multi-messenger, uh, we have our, or we, we can do in a way multi-messenger physics with a single detector because we have all these layers. And um, you might be, you might be uh, familiar. I think we, we hear a lot about multi-messenger astrophysics nowadays where uh, you have a detector here that looks at cosmic rays uh, and you have a detector like LIGO that looks at gravitational wave. And then you have different um, detectors that look at the electromagnetic spectrum in different bands. You have to, you have experiments like Ice Cube that are trying to measure neutrinos, and all of this information is combined, or you know, depending on how much signal we get from different events, this information is combined, and you're trying to learn something, um, basically trying to trying to see from different angle a a certain event. And depending on the type of event you're looking at, sometimes you may have just electromagnetic uh, wave and, and cosmic rays. Sometimes you have gravitational wave that can uh, that you can measure. And um, what we're doing, so in our case, uh, we get information from uh, electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic wave. We detect photons. That's something that I specialize on that I'll be discussing in more detail um, next, uh, next Friday. Uh, most of our information comes from the equivalent of cosmic rays, which is we see those, those hadrons that are being measured uh, by the detectors. Uh, so if I go back here, so, so this, uh, those charge hadrons here are roughly the, the, the astrophysics equivalent of cosmic rays. Now, of course, we don't see any gravitational wave coming out of, of what, what we do, nor neutrinos. It's not neutrinos are not produced, but they're very difficult to measure. You can see here how much ice you actually need to, uh, to measure neutrinos in, in the ice cube experiment. Uh, if you see something, I hadn't noticed, but I think the Eiffel Tower is somewhere here. It's tiny here. It gives you an idea of, of the height of, of ice. Um, so we combine all this information and we try to learn about what happens in a heavy end collision. Now, before I go to the next section, I don't know if there's any question. I'm happy to take any question uh, if there's anything at the moment. Looks all good. All right. Smiling faces, yeah. so go ahead. <laughs> all right, sounds good. All right, so, so as I said, we're colliding the nucleus inside the detectors. 
we see this coming out and we're trying to figure out what happens in between. And after a few decades of, of work, our understanding is that uh, the image of the bottom is this cartoon of the bottom is roughly what happens. You have the two nucleus colliding. The nucleus are very strongly Lorentz contracted because they're, they have such a high chaotic energy. They have such a high velocity. They collide and they form through a process I still being um, um, studied. They form the, the quark gluon plasma. For a short amount of time, there's a small region of space uh, that where you have a, a plasma quark and gluon being produced. Now you're producing this in the vacuum of the beam, beam pipe. Almost instantly, you after you produce it, it starts expanding extremely rapidly, and it as it's expanding, it's cooling down. So very rapidly, you recombine into hadrons, into quarks and gluon bound states. And these are the ones that eventually you measure in your detector. So this is what uh, we're especially interested in. This is where the quark-gluon plasma uh, lives. Uh, now for reference, uh, these are the unit scales that we use when we study heavy end collision. So we use the Fermi, which is 10 to the minus five meters. Um, it's roughly a diameter of a proton. So diameter of a nucleus is about 10 Fermi. And the unit scale that we use for time is Fermi over the speed of light, which is about 10 to the minus 24 seconds. Uh, now, as you can see, so I said the, the diameter of nucleus is about uh, 10 Fermi. So the spatial extent of the plasma is roughly 10 Fermi. Uh, its lifetime is about uh, 10 Fermi per C. Uh, so it's roughly the time it takes for a ray of light to cross one side of the nucleus and to go to the other side of the nucleus. So it's a very short amount of time. Um, right, so roughly one Fermi about the, after the, one Fermi over C after the collision, you produce, you form the quadrant plasma. By the time you reach 10 Fermi per C in time, um, you already recombine into hadrons. Now, how do we understand what's happening the, during the collision? So, so what we do is that uh, we, we do a hydrodynamic simulation of the plasma. Uh, we say that the plasma has a certain, uh, we know the nucleus collides with a certain geometry. They will deposit energy in a certain pattern. You, uh, you initialize your hydrodynamics according to um, this this pattern of, of energy, and you let it evolve. And if you let it evolve, you obtain um, you obtain uh, something like this. Uh, so what I am showing here is uh, so let's focus first on the figure at the bottom here. So for the figure at the bottom is a if you look if you have the collision um, let's you have a collision like this, you cut in the plane transverse to it. And you look at how the plasma is expanding in this plane transverse. So you can see here that you, you start with something that's roughly the size of nucleus um, here, and then uh, it expands in the, in the direction uh, transverse the collision axis. Now, if you take only one slice here and you check how it evolves over time, so basically you take the different time step and you just put them, put them here. You can see as a function of, of time uh, how the temperature of the plasma, how this is not the temperature, this is actually the energy density, how the energy density is evolving as a function of time. So you can see, of course, in the middle, your plasma is uh, hotter. And the middle here is roughly the middle of your two nucleus, the overlap between your two nucleus. And as you go to the side, it's colder because there's less matter on the side. The nucleus has more has most of its nucleon in a way in the center. If you uh, if you remember that you're you're uh, flattening your nucleus, right, because of Lorentz contraction. And as time evolves, your density is dropping. 
and your plasma is um, is cooling. Right. So the density is dropping, which means that the temperature is is decreasing. The plasma is cooling down. So you go from having uh, quarks and gluons here to having this crossover phase to having um, hadrons, so pions, gluons, protons, neutrons. Now, what is this crossover phase? There's a crossover phase because uh, for nuclear matter, there's no phase transition between having um, quarks and a plasma of quarks and gluons and having uh, a gas of hadrons. Now, I have to be careful when I say this. This is only true if you have roughly the same number of matter and antimatter in your system. So roughly the same amount of quarks and antiquark in your system. So in that case, you get this, you have, um, you don't have a phase transition between hadrons and quark. And so what you have instead is an extended crossover where you have something that is um, already a pretty strongly coupled uh, liquid of quark and gluon. It's a more and more strongly coupled liquid of quark and gluon. And eventually the, the um, this is a process that's not, I would say very well understood, but effectively your, your quark and gluons start forming bound states. And at some point, you clearly have a gas of bound state. You clearly have a gas of hadrons, but it's very difficult to tell exactly at which point. There are some pseudo critical temperature you can define, um, but in practice, it's difficult to tell at what point you really went from something that was so strong that were quarks and gluons, which were very strongly coupled, to something where you had uh, actual bound states. All right. So, um, so we can. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll focus mainly on. So there's actually quite a bit to to say about the thermodynamic property of of the quadrant plasma. But let me focus instead on the uh, near equilibrium properties of the quadrant plasma. Uh, what I mean by near equilibrium, I mean let's again talk think about this box of quark and gluon. And what you're doing inside this box of quarks and gluon is, let's assume it's an equilibrium. Uh, then you can do thermodynamic and you can discuss about the equation of state, and which is something that, uh, that at, at the moment is, is relatively well known. Um, so the equation of state, so for example, this is the speed of sound of, uh, of nuclear matter. If you have this box, of quark and gluon, or you have this box of, of uh, a gas of hadrons after the quarks and gluons fall down. So we know the equation of state because we, we know the speed of sound because we know the equation of state. So the speed of sound here is in units of uh, the speed of light. So this is speed of sound squared. So this is in, uh, 0.2 times uh, the speed of light. So you can see the sound travel extremely fast in, um, in a quark gluon plasma. Now imagine you have this box and you introduce a small perturbation. So what you're doing is that you're sending basically sound waves in your plasma. Now what happens if you send those sound waves? Well, if the plasma has no viscosity, what you would see is those sound waves would propagate forever. Now the plasma has some finite viscosity, which means that the sound waves are slowly dampening. So as you go farther and farther from the point where you uh, introduce a perturbation, uh, you have um, you have smaller and smaller um, oscillation of your plasma. Now, the shear and the ball viscosity are two properties that characterize how these waves will bend. Um, now, there's something um, that is counterintuitive about viscosity that I'll, I'll I'll try to explain with an imperfect example, but I think it um, I think it helps understand um, the, the subtleties. So so if your plasma is very strongly coupled, you expect to have a small viscosity, and if it's weakly coupled, you expect to have a large viscosity. Now I think. Okay, let, let me not repeat why we tend to, I think we tend to think it's the opposite because it's better to, um, better not for misinformation to be repeated. Um, so, 
So let me explain how you, one way to make sense of this. Let's say you want to send to propagate information from, uh, let's say you have this, this uh, ensemble of masses and sprigs, and you want to send information from uh, this one here to this one here. Um, if you have a very, so if your spring is very stiff, what you can do is you send the way here, you move this mass here, the string is very stiff. So this mass will basically move at the same time and this mass will move at the same time. So you can propagate information over a very long distance by having very stiff springs. On the other hand, if you have a very weak spring, you, you try to move this, this mass and this one kind of moves a little bit, but the lot of information is lost. This one moves a little less. And by the time you reach this one, you have no idea what kind of signal we're trying to send. Now, the key here is that we are trying to send information um, in a way by collective motion, right? So, so that's why sending information by collective motion, it's easier to have strong coupling than you have weak coupling. Now I think or reflects the reason I think we tend to think the opposite is that we tend to think it's easier to send information by just sending this particle here, here. So if you just want to throw the particle at someone else, it's easier to have a quick, weak coupling. It's easier if it doesn't touch anything. That's not, that's not what viscosity is about. It's about sending collective information. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why, so that's one way of, of uh, remembering that, um, um, if the plasma is very strongly coupled, you expect to have very, uh, very weak, uh, so very small viscosity. Um, now, uh, if we're trying to plot what the viscosity is a function of temperature, which is something we'd like to either compute or extract, and as I discussed earlier, uh, something we can compute at very high temperature, because it's a gas here, but it's very difficult to compute here at low temperature. Um, now, what do you expect? You expect, um, here it's weakly coupled, so you expect the largest viscosity. Here, it's still, here it's actually weakly coupled, and, and I want you to notice very carefully the difference. Here you start, at very high temperature, you start with a weakly coupled gas of quarks and gluons. Then you go to strongly coupled, yeah, strongly coupled liquid of quarks and gluons. Then as you drop the temperature even more, so effectively, the quarks and gluons are so strongly interacting that they form bound states. And now what you're left with, so now your quarks and gluons are extremely strongly interacting, but the degrees of freedom that you're looking at are no longer quarks and gluons, they're the bound states. And how strongly do the bound states interact? They, inter they interact weakly because uh, they interact through some residual um, force that is left. Uh, so you're going from, Weakly coupled gas of quarks and gluons to strongly coupled gas, strongly coupled liquid of quarks and gluons to a weakly coupled gas of hadrons. So you do have to notice the change in, in degrees of freedom. Now, what you expect is weak coupling in general means uh, large viscosity, and strong coupling means uh, small viscosity. Yeah. Yeah. It's from outside. Continue. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So you expect something large here, something large here, something small here. Now, before I say anything, so, so we're using, here I'm using uh, et al. Grace. That's the shear viscosity over entropy density. Um, as you can see here, it's actually a quantity that matters. So shear vis so the shear viscosity itself is eta. It's a dimensionful quantity. Um, so we scale it by the entropy. In a way, it's, it's roughly speaking a way to take, um, to take out the dependence on, um, um, basically the density of your system. So of course, if you have a denser system, you tend to have, uh, uh, in a way, more interactions. Uh, so you, have, you tend to have more viscosity, but that, that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in comparing different substances, and then you need to take out kind of their, uh, their scaling with the density. So we do et over s, and here you can see the, the, the scale that I have, et over s goes, uh, and here it's an, it's an the units that we use in, in particle physics where uh, h bar is one, the speed of sound is one, and so on. So, um, but let, let me show you what 
um, what this looks like for other substances. So you get a, a sense of, of the scale we're looking at. So the, the shear viscosity over entropy density of water, depending on uh, the pressure, is, is somewhere in this, in this region here. So it's, it's above one. It's maybe, uh, depending on the temperature of order, uh, one to 10 in units of H bar over kb. Uh, helium, which is typically something that, that we think has very low viscosity, is, all, is, is still above when the, the lowest point is still around one. Now, what we're looking at for the coagulant plasma is, is between zero and one here. So it's, it's lower than any other liquid uh, that's been, um, that's been uh, studied. Um, now, all of this, so this is not temp absolute temperature. This is the temperature over some sort of critical temperature. Uh, again, when you have a when you have a crossover instead of a phase transition, you don't necessarily have a well-defined uh, TC, but you have you can have pseudo critical temperature that you use to uh, to define uh, uh, TC and to scale. And you can see most substances they seem to have uh, they go from. Uh, they seem to have a minimum somewhere around uh, this TC. Right, so what we know is that at very high temperature, as I said, you, it's a gas, we can compute it. At very low temperature, it's a gas. That's a little bit harder because it's a gas of hadrons. Um, there's hundreds of species of hadrons, so it's a bit challenging to actually compute um, uh, this, this viscosity, but it's been done. Uh, mainly using numerical simulation. Uh, if you go very low temperature, you have mainly a gas of pion. So there you have a little more control over uh, your calculation. And somewhere in between is what we're interested in. So we'd like to either compute or measure the viscosity. And what we do using ABN collisions is to try to uh, measure this viscosity. Now, again, as I said, what we do is we do those simulations. And um, and the idea is that you try different viscosities. These different viscosities will give you different temperature profile. And these different temperature profile will give you different final state particles that you can compare with what's being measured in experiments. And, and what you can do is try hundreds, thousands of different uh, viscosities, different temperature dependence for your viscosities. And then you can see which ones are consistent with the data. Now, that's where the big data aspect comes in, because, um, because it's such an indirect measurement of the viscosity of your plasma. You need a lot of information. And so often, um, we will plot our data as function of centrality, which is the degree of overlap of your nucleus. And you can see here some of the measurements that we use. These are the these are a different species of hadrons as function of centrality. Uh, this is the average momentum of these different species of hadron uh, as function of centrality. Uh, these are measurements from the Ellis collaboration. And there are dozens and, and to be fair, hundreds more measurements that you can use. And what we do is we try to uh, try different viscosities, try to compare with as much data as possible. And then we try to see um, which of those viscosities are consistent with the data. And that gives us a, a spread. So, so this is an example, a, an analysis that we did a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, this was done by um, very bright uh, graduate students, uh, Derek Everett at Ohio State, and Wei Yao Kei at Duke and, and many others. Um, and so we collaborated together in the, uh, the Jetscape collaboration. And so each line here is effectively a different set of viscosity. And I, I glazed over this, but there are other uh, uncertainty in the model that we need, to, uh, we need to average over. So we also try different types of initial condition for the hydrodynamics. And so every line here corresponds to a different initial condition, choice of viscosity, and so on, that, roughly speaking, is consistent with data. And it's a, the data and its uncertainty. Now, you can see, actually, the band seems to be a little bit wider than the data. And that's also where the, the big data and the machine learning part enters. Uh, it's actually typically not possible to take 
um, um, to take basically take all these different viscosities, run them in the model, put them in the model, run the model as supercomputer and compare with data. You cannot do this for thousands or tens of thousands of viscosity. It becomes too demanding. So often we use, we take the model and we construct a, we basically sample the model, we sample different viscosity and then we interpolate between those viscosities. And so instead of trying, um, you know, a million viscosities, we try we we sample a hundred and we try to guess what the model would predict between those viscosities. Now the result is we have it's it's a systematic thing that we do, but we do have some uncertainty in the in the model that's beyond uh, beyond the the experimental uncertainty. So that means that uh, we cannot necessarily get uh, that means that. The, the fact that we have a spread here is coming effectively from the uh, difficulty of comparing our model to the data. It's not coming just from the experimental uncertainty of the data. And so if you combine, if you look at all these different lines with different viscosities and you look at what kind of, of viscosity you find that are consistent with the data, uh, what we found is a curve like this, um, where uh, so this is a pretty small range of temperature. This is between, uh, so at 150, uh, so at 0.15 GeV, you expect that you're roughly back into a gas of hadrons. And at high temperature, this is the strongly coupled liquid phase. And uh, as you can see, we, uh, so the gray region is roughly speaking, all the different viscosities that we tried and the colored region, the, the orange region, is um, the ones that we found to be consistent with the data. As you could see, actually, the constraints that we found are not, um, they're not very strong. And one of the reason is that uh, the model, it's, it's very challenging to model a heavy end collision. And this difficulty translates into um, effectively into uncertainty when you compare with data. And when you take into account more and more of that uncertainty, it becomes more and more difficult to, to constrain your discuss. Now I'll discuss models of heavy collision in, in more details uh, next time. Um, this is the introduction I wanted to give you. So, so let me give a, let me show a brief summary. Um, we use ultra-realistic collisions of nucleus to produce polygon plasma, and we're trying to systematically extract its properties. Uh, for example, its, its shear viscosity. Um, we are hoping to use, just like in astrophysics, people have been using multi-messenger uh, astrophysics to try to better understand some system. We're hoping to use uh, multi-messenger approaches. Now, exactly what is different messenger is there's some debate I, I'd, I'd argue certainly that photons and hadrons are different messengers some people would argue that different types of quark can be different messengers as well and uh i i'll discuss this in more detail next time but we also um the hydrodynamics that i described is not your your um typical hydrodynamics that you use to uh, to build an, an F1 car or, or a Corolla, it's uh, it's what you what you use to describe a fluid that's expanding at relativistic uh, velocities. Um, so we've also been able to do some some trail, trailblazing study of, of uh, relativistic viscous hydrodynamics using a collision of nucleus. Now let me stop here, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Super. Uh, thank you very much for this really comprehensive uh, re uh, introduction to heavy ion collisions as a phenomenological study. Uh, do we have questions? Yeah. Uh, I have one, but it might be slightly technical. Um, you mentioned earlier that when we're looking at the, the crossover, we have this sort of gradual transition from a quark uh, plasma to a sort of weak hadron gas. And you mentioned that it's gradual because we have roughly equal parts matter and antimatter. Is there a, a deeper reason why that that's the condition for for gradual as opposed to some sort of very 
hard uh, sort of cut off. Yeah, I think, okay. Um, if it's too technical, then maybe. No, no, no that, that's a very good question. So, right. So I think the way I phrased it, it suggested that we understand why, um, why if you have the symmetry between matter and antimatter, um, it, it's a crossover. I'd say uh, we, we actually, so, so I don't think we understand deeply um, why you have a crossover in, in that case and you don't have a crossover in um, if you have this asymmetry. Um, if if you happen to, to know, maybe you've heard other uh, presentation about uh, heavy end collision, especially if you look at lower energy collision or if you look at um, maybe even neutron star mergers. Uh, Typically, those have pretty strong asymmetry between or between matter and antimatter, and there we expect so we expect a first order phase transition um, between uh, between the two phases. Now, the 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 reason we we don't know very well so we don't know very well what the Kuchner state is, and I'd say um, if we knew why. Uh, if we knew the condition for a crossover, I think it would it would suggest that we would be able to tell a much better um, what, whether they, they're they see how far the crossover extends and so on. So long story short, I, I don't think we know actually why um, when you have this a sim, when you have this symmetry, you you get confinement. Okay, thank you. Super good. Other questions. Yeah, please call. Cool. Uh, yeah, I, I'm in your plot where you plotted the E over S versus uh, temperature and you had the constraints. Yeah, why is it so <laughs> why is it so badly constrained at higher temperatures? Is there an easy way to understand that? So was, yeah. In a way, so the easy way to understand that is that um, we're effectively um, Right, so so the way that we actually uh, compare with data, we we start with some initial condition, we have a high dynamic evolution, we produce hadrons at the end, and then we compare with data. So this gives us actually a false sense that what we're doing is actually um, is actually um, we have it gives us a false sense that we know what's happening at early time. But really what we're doing is we're always just constraining what's happening at later time when you produce your hadrons. So effectively, the more you go back in time, the less, um, the less information you know. So the more possibilities there are, the more possible shear and ball viscosity there can be that would give you a similar profile at later time. So because we do this, this in a way, in reality, we do this backward in time constraining of of the shear viscosity because the data is at late is effectively at late time, and that means that we do a we start constraining more at lower temperature, and the more we go back in time, the less certain we are. That's why we have the less we have less and less constraint at high temperature. And then, I mean. Thanks. That that makes a lot of sense to me. And then it gets bigger again at very low temperature. Is that because of the uncertainties maybe in modeling hadrons and stuff like that? Or is that yeah. Just, yeah. Here it's it's less clear actually. So so I should say um, this this is I think this was a very carefully designed study. We're very proud, and I would still say that it's one of the best constraints we have at the moment. Even if more constraints have come out since, because we're extremely careful in assessing the model uncertainty. That being said, I don't think it's the end of the story. One thing that we've seen is that um, um, it's very difficult to, it's very challenging to match your hydrodynamics to your production of hadrons. So this, if I go back here, you have this, um, you have the coagulant plasma here, you have the crossover, and then you have hadron. So somewhere in between, you need to do a transition from hydrodynamics to hadrons. Um, now, in a, in a way, this is an impossible transition to make because here, those hadrons, you need to know the momentum distribution of hundreds of species of hadrons. 
While in hydrodynamics, the only thing that you have is effectively the energy density of all these hadrons combined together. So you go from having not enough information to needing a lot of information. Now, what you're saved by is the fact we think that you're very close to uh, local equilibrium. So you expect your momentum distribution should be pretty close to Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein, but there's uncertainty in this transition. And we think that this uncertainty in the transition is also what's making, uh, what's leading to uncertainty here at low temperature. So, so as you can see, what I'm saying is very high temperature is difficult and at very low temperature is also difficult. So it is a very difficult problem. Thanks. Super. Other questions? Well, it's an well, maybe I'll take a, or unless yeah, you have a. I also have one. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, if you go to your spread of um, of fits to to data, right. So when you when you were talking about this, that you were interpolating using AI uh, between things that you could do, um, would it make any sense then to look at the things that where AI tries to tells you it would interpolate to something that is very close to the data to actually do specific runs right in that corner? Or is that too too hard to, to aim um, <laughs> or something else? No, so actually, so that's something we actually did not do in this analysis that um, is, is something other groups did later and it's a very, very good idea, which is um, you can't really take, you know, hundreds of these curves and, and run. I mean, you could do it, but it's, yeah. it's the most efficient use of, of, of a, a supercomputer. But certainly what you can do is take you know, five samples out of them that are the most representative. And by that, I mean, you take five samples of, of what we call the posterior and, mm -hmm. and then you run, right? Now, that is, that is a very good idea because then you can see if those five actually um, fit very well then that suggests that actually it's working quite well. So your your machine. You would also say that your interpolation is not totally off, right? Something exactly, like exactly. Um, now here the the width is a little bit misleading because of course here you're kind of in the tail of your of your uncertainty, and it's harder to see. They see a density of line in the middle that I think our, our eyes are drawn to to the width rather than the density of line. But it, it's certainly true. You, you you want to double check that. Yeah. Super. Um, I had one question, which was you showed the speed of sound squared and showed that it was um, close to, it was going to a third asymptotically at high temperature, which I understand is you're going to a massless limit. Um, yeah. I was surprised that the speed of sound squared goes so large at low temperatures um, and even seems to saturate the, the one third limit that I associate with a massless theory. So do you have a, a sense of what's happening at low temperature where the speed of sound is getting so so fast? Let's see. So so if I look at the scale, so this is about a hundred MeV. Um, so the short answer is um, no, I don't have because because let's say between between a hundred and hundred fifty. This is actually a very complicated, and there's quite a bit of uncertainty to This is a very complicated system, right? Where you have, uh, you know, 500 species of hadron interacting. Okay, to be fair, as you go to lower temperature, you have fewer and fewer species right. that are relevant. But the cross, the proton-proton cross section, and the pion-pion cross section is actually pretty complicated. Um, mm. So exactly why I don't know if I have the intuition. That being said, if you go at if you keep going at lower temperature. This becomes just a gas of time, right? Mm -hmm. And you would imagine that, and I, I know there's been studies, you can compute this with, um, with, I mean, literally, you can just do an ideal gas of time, and you mm -hmm. get to say that's pretty good. And why would, why would you go to a specific value? Yeah, I don't know if I don't know if the idea is that you go back to a limit where you you, you have few scales basically. The only scale that matter might be the the pion scale or the Carroll uh, um, some some sort of a uh, Carroll scale. Um, 
I don't know if that might be a reason. Uh, that's a good question. Somehow I I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I have no idea either. Okay. Yeah. Super. Well, um, uh, thank you so much. Um, and we will see you next week. Let's thank a speaker one last time. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. We'll see you next week. I'll see you next. Yeah. Really, really. <laughs> uh, have a great week, and we'll see you uh, this coming Friday. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Bye. Cheers. Goodbye. Okay,